Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. John Kelly Profiler here, and welcome. Welcome to a very, very sad, sad case. This is part two of two missing moms up in Oklahoma. You know, I have to tell you, we're very lucky today to have Dustin Rank with us. You've seen Dustin before. By popular demand, he is back. Uh, Dustin is a private investigator. Uh, Dustin is very familiar with this area up in Oklahoma. I am not going to tell you where Dustin is from. Okay. He's at a non-disclosed site. Uh, and he's looking into this case. Uh, also, we'll put a link up uh, for Dustin's art. If uh, if that's okay with Dustin. If it's not okay with him, it won't go up. It's going to depend on, he on how he feels about this. So we're off and running now. Thanks for joining in uh, and bringing us into your house. We're off and running now into, uh, you know, this crime and, 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 you know, the abduction. And I believe in abduction of these two missing moms. They're not just two missing women. They're two missing moms. So there's a lot of other victims out there. And our condolences go out to the... Uh, you know, friends and family of the two missing moms. Uh, it's a very sad case. And, um, you know, hopefully we're going to get, uh, you know, some feedback and get to the bottom of it. We've already gotten some tips and some tips will be going over to law enforcement. Some have gone over. Uh, right now, our focus is on how organized was this abduction? And I do believe it was an abduction. OK, so let me come out on that right now and say that's what I do believe. And we want to know how organized was the perp or perps on this that pulled this off. But first of all, we need some background on the area. We need to know about the area. And nobody I know knows it better than Dustin. Dustin, welcome and please continue. Yeah, thanks for having me again, John. It's good to be here with you and all your audience. So I uh, appreciate it always. Yeah, that area is is pretty unique. You know, Oklahoma's got some interesting geography. When you get out into that panhandle area, it is, it's very arid. You know, it's very flat. It, you got line of sight for miles in every direction. You know, most of the time, the only trees you're going to find are along creek beds or somebody's yard. It's not you know, it's not like Oregon where they're just sprouting up out of the ground everywhere. Uh, it, you know, it's a very rural community. I mean, you got generations of families that have been farming and ranching out there for, you know, 150 years. So everybody knows each other out there, you know, from one way or another, either doing business, they go to the same schools, what have you. So it's a it's an interesting place to see a crime like this occur, you know, and I know that that's a really hot topic in the state of Oklahoma right now, understandably, uh, especially, you know, these two women, these two moms, you know, show up, uh, turn up missing on their way to a, a child exchange thing. So, man, it's really, people are really on edge about it, you know, understandably. I mean, it, it's obviously a horrible crime, regardless of what's taken place. I mean, it's, Anytime somebody like that goes missing, I mean, that area out there, I mean, I can't underscore enough how it's just it's just vast, you know, and it really concerned me when I saw this pop up because I, I know that area and I know the towns that these women were from. And, you know, you, you've got a, a timeline here of them leaving the house to a drop off is you know, 14 to 12 minutes, <laughs> you know, it, it is not far. And as we talked, it's not, it's not like these women were traveling to Oklahoma city, you know, a couple hundred miles away, they get nabbed, you know, right out of the gate and nobody's expecting them for three or four hours. I mean, hell, you know, whoever was on the other end of that exchange was expecting them in 15 or 20 minutes. So, you know, whatever went on out there, Man, you know, time was of the essence and they wanted them bad and they really didn't care at all about, you know, getting caught <laughs> because you don't have a lot of leeway there. You know, somebody picks up the phone and says, hey, man, 
I got two moms missing. They're supposed to be here 15, 20 minutes ago. It doesn't give you a lot of room to get away with, especially with an abduction, you know, and I've heard you talk about this before when you've got people that you've snatched either off the street or from a, from a location or whatever the case may be, you know, I mean, that you, you got to manage that somehow. So man, it's a, it's really a intense situation to be sure. Yeah, you definitely, uh, you definitely have to control it. There's no question about it. And where I see some uh, organization, I see it in the root. I see it in, you know, the perp or perps, you know, knowing the root, knowing exactly which way they were coming. These two women were coming, you know, they already had a pre uh, destined uh, pickup place where they're going to pick up the kids. It seems like it was a, an abandoned gas station. As crazy as that is, I mean, I, I, I don't know why they would agree with that, that the pickup uh, place would be an abandoned gas station. But that's is so far what we're hearing that, you know, would uh, have me thinking right away. You know, I want a place that's more populated, more people around, more mm -hmm. eyes on camera on, you know, some yeah. kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, area where there's a lot of socialization going on. But, um, you know, obviously, uh, these gals may have had some trust in uh, whoever they were meeting or whoever was negotiating the deal or were talked into it. And maybe not, maybe not, maybe this was just beautiful ambush. Beautiful ambush set up. Hey, how are you? You know, boom. Yeah, let's do this. Let's do that. It's been a long time. You know, hi. You know, and then bang, you know, they took over. They took control mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, like when you have a crime scene like this, in order to be successful, you have to be able to control the people one way or the other. And, um, you know, the question is, how did they control them? You know, that's what's uh, of interest to me, you know. Um, what do you think about the car not being burned, all right? Now, when I say it looks like, you know, there was some organization here, okay. You know, they knew the route where they were coming. They knew the uh, drop-off pickup spot, you know. But, you know, the car not being burned, all right? I mean, what do you make of that? Because... If you want to pull off, right? I mean, and they're in the car. Um, why not just hurt them in the car? And I'll even say the word. If you're about to murder them, why not kill them in the car? Okay. Or if you're not inside the car, and you've left no DNA or no trace evidence or no fingerprints, right? You know, why not just, you know, pop them and walk away, right? So I wonder about that. Because what this looks like to me is, you know, the car was pulled over violently or, you know, uh, just through uh you know talk and conversation they were able to get these two women out if so they had to be transported somewhere in something else right. okay you know and transportation can mean a lot of different things it can be even walked you know to your death like we have up in delphi mm -hmm. you know I mean, somebody marching you away is kind of transporting you in a marching kind of situation. So the problem, the problem I have is the lack of sophistication here, because now you got two vehicles, two vehicles that could possibly have trace evidence, DNA, fingerprints, whatever trace might be, okay? in two different vehicles, because once you're in a vehicle, and especially if you're in a vehicle with other people, I mean, you know, hair fibers, uh, skin follicles, uh, there's a certain amount of trace 
um, or just evidence in general, physical evidence in general, that is just going to, you know, be generated throughout the course, especially if there's some kind of struggle. Yeah, you know, then they're then, then really, you know, and and you know, uh, uh, on a couple of different uh, news outlets, we've heard possible blood. Mm -hmm. Whose blood? Okay, that's going to be tested. All right. Um, nobody's mentioned hearing any gunshots. A good question for you. Do you think if guns were fired out there, people would hear it? I mean, oh, not that they couldn't use a silencer or something, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, I mean, it's routine out in that area because there is a huge population of hunting. So if somebody mm. heard a couple of gunshots, honestly, nobody's going to pay any attention to it. It's not like in the city, you know, if you're, if you live where I do and you start hearing gunshots, man, you better start taking some action or calling 911 yeah. out there. That, that's, you know, I, again they're, they're you know guys are out you know they're out target shooting it's still really common to just go out plinking knocking beer cans off the fence post you know like so the, the hunting thing that's a common pastime out there so nobody's gonna even think twice about hearing a gunshot especially there because i mean i'm telling you there is not much around it isn't like that four corners area where that drop off was you know it wasn't like you got a you know, 7-Eleven there or something. I mean, there's nobody there. There ain't nothing there. So, yeah, the, the gunshot thing wouldn't ring a, you know, wouldn't throw up a red flag at all. You know, uh, it just comes with the territory of rural Oklahoma or any, you know, Texas, Kansas. I mean, that's, that's pretty common stuff. So um, what is interesting in me john and we talked about this a little bit is and you talked about the lack of sophistication and i 100 percent agree with that because you know like these these women had a obviously this was a you know custody things you know when you're talking about exchange of kids those are those are pretty you know consistent schedules you know generally for you know i mean you got the parents they got work and they got lives but kids got school and so it has to be pretty structured you know and okay, like, and I could see them getting, you know, if, if that's a custody related abduction, and I'm not saying it is, we don't know, but yeah, you know, if they were driving a long way away, yeah, it makes sense, but it's not. I mean, the, the proximity and the time constraints to pull that off is, I mean, that's a pretty boneheaded maneuver, man, you know, because they just live 10, 12 miles up the road. If somebody really wanted to get to one of those women, you know, they could have just done a home invasion, you, you know, and nobody exactly. would have seen her for seven or eight hours. I mean, hell, it might be longer than that, you know, if she was not scheduled to work the next day. I mean, nobody would have maybe given it a thought. So there, there's an element of, I mean, that just, there's an element of timing there that really i mean we know that criminals aren't always thinking this stuff through but man you talk about yeah it's yeah i get it it's remote and all that but it's high risk because i mean hell you can identify a car you know a half mile away if you see two women struggling with one or more perps on the side of the road you're gonna see that for you know if you're driving 60 miles an hour which nobody does out there it's more like 75 80 85 you know you're you could not see somebody for a couple minutes and then the next thing you know bam you've got a car or cars literally right on top of you so there was some for whatever reason there was some you know lack of planning urgency whatever you know the fact that and you mentioned the car about not being burned it really screams to me like these whatever this situation is is that that's a message because we don't have the women they're not at the scene dead and so they're missing, they're abducted, they're, they're, we don't know where they are, but nobody's called it in to take advantage of it. It's not like they're wanting a ransom, you know, or something else. I mean, hell, what's it been? It's been like 10, 11 days or something. So, ah, gosh, that just gives me a really bad feeling. You know, nobody's taken ownership of it. Uh, nobody wanted to leave them there. They, they took them to send a message. It, it just breaks my heart. Yeah, this is a this is a really heartbreaking situation, and uh, you know, getting back, 
you know, uh, to the uh, uh, motive. I mean, and you have to talk about this because it's right at the top of a pop being a possible motive. Okay. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, that's going through the court and, um, you know, the custody battle, right. And fighting yeah. for custody and everything. I mean, that's at the top of the list because it has to be at the top of the list. These women, I do not believe were abducted for sexual reasons, although they say, um, and I want to run this by you to see if you're familiar with this at all, that there's a lot of sex trafficking out there. You know, I oh, mean, yeah. I just I just don't see that happening here. Could have happened. I could be all wrong. Uh, but the odds don't seem to be with any kind of sexual abduction. OK, um, the odds don't and percentages don't seem to be there. And whenever you're working the angles, you got to work the percentages. Uh, if not, you know, the angles are going to end up working you. I mean, there's no question about it. And then the other um, possible motive, as, as w whenever we look at one of these crimes, you know, is, um, you know, financial. Well, I mean, how much money would anybody get from these two women. So I don't think it was financial. I mean, they have this little car. My God, they didn't even carjack the car and try and sell it, right? So, right. I mean, I don't think this is all, is all at all about money. And I don't think it's at all about sex. So the only, you know, uh, white elephant in the room that we got hanging over it is this custody battle, okay? And the right. battle that was going on. Now, a point you brought up that was excellent why not do a home invasion 15 minutes away and take out the person that's your primary concern? That's your primary right. objective. Why not do that? Why, why get one? Why not take one instead of having to take two? Okay? Because now you've got double trouble. You've got a woman who's a court court appointed supervisor by the courts that was going out there with Veronica and she's gone too. Okay. Miss Kelly is gone. All right. And so, you know, now you've got double trouble. All right. Oh, and no. what role did she play in this? You know, she, yeah, she would have been there. She would have uh, been focused in, lasered in on the uh, relationship and the way the kids were acting with the mother, the way the mother was acting with the kids, stuff like that. You know, court, court appointed supervisor for the visitation. I mean, that's how it all. That's how it always works. But bottom bottom line, yeah, she could go back and she'll write a report. And it could be favorable, okay, to Jillian Kelly. But the bottom line is for something that minute, are you, you know, stupid enough? I gotta say, stupid enough to take the risk. Yeah. To at the very least kidnap uh, through an abduction uh, a court a court appointed woman who really you know uh, doesn't necessarily have to be in the plan uh right. if your plan was uh, focused on uh you know getting rid of uh, veronica and keeping veronica out of the game so i mean i i i i see the um the uh confidence here in the assailant i see um you know, they've got a lot of guts to try and pull something off like this in the daytime and everything. You know, um, you know, they there's no question about it. OK, they're 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 a criminal big time. They've this isn't uh, I don't think. You know, um, it might be their first rodeo. I can't say it's not the first rodeo, but they've been involved in other stuff. They have a high risk tolerance. Uh, um, 
be their downfall because mitigated and got rid of a lot of risk here. Okay. You could oh, yeah. have gotten a lot rid of a lot of risk here um, by just not dealing with both women at the same time, you know, uh, in Oklahoma. And like you said, by dealing with, uh, you know, Miss Kelly over at the, uh, over in Kansas. All right. So, I mean, that's, that's what I'm looking at. Um, and I'm sorry with uh, Veronica over in uh, Kansas, not Miss Kelly. Miss Kelly's a supervisor. I mean, so what, what else do you see here? I mean, you know, it looks like, you know, uh, kind of organized just in the ambush part of it, and then a loss of sophistication and uh, and uh, organizational skills. Uh, yeah, to follow to follow the ambush. Yeah, there's there's a couple angles there that it, it really that that are gonna kind of illuminate what you just said, John, and one of them that isn't really currently being talked about, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, Veronica is at the, in the one in the middle of this custody thing. And Mrs. Kelly is the supervisor, but, you know, since they didn't grab up Veronica on her own, I mean, there'd been a million places they could have accessed her that would have not drawn attention for, for as much as maybe 48 hours. So it makes me wonder, was Mrs. Kelly not just the collateral damage, but maybe the person they were going after? Did she write a report that wasn't it favorable? Was her, uh, were her observations something that were causing more contention uh, or more grief, you know, in, in that circle? I, obviously, we don't know yet, but it's something I would look long and hard at for sure, because like you said, trying to manage two people that you've scooped up is infinitely harder. And especially again, back to the time constraint, that's a big deal. You know, that is a high risk maneuver, high risk tolerance deal. All right. So do you want to go over what you were just talking about as far as, because uh, I think it's very interesting. You're saying this could be a vendetta against, uh, you know, Mrs. Kelly. That's you right. Know, Nully, you know, because maybe she had written a report already and that was not right. favorable um, right. to the other party. And they're uh, really uh, upset over that. And they have a bone of contention with her. That's right. And now if if that if that's the case, you know, if, if you're going to grab up two women, you're going to get rid of, you know, that perceived problem one of, you know, and, and I'm not calling Miss mrs butler uh, problem but you know if somebody's viewing it that way enough to abduct them they're going to get a twofer out of that deal and try to put that thing to bed now as we were talking kind of early in the show there about you know the rural area this this case brings back a lot of feelings for people in oklahoma going back if we get back into our time machine and jump back about 20 some odd years there's a really big case that's still actually ongoing even though they've made an arrest in it up in northeastern oklahoma uh, Loria Freeman uh, or Loria Bible, uh, the Bible Freeman case, uh, where you had two guys. Well, actually, you had a crew of five guys that were definitely not sophisticated. You know, they they ruled uh, with an iron fist out there. They're drug dealers, drug producers. They had connections and they're extremely violent. Right. They go to collect on a drug debt. They wind up killing the dad and the mom, burning their trailer to the ground. And it just so happens that these two girls are having a slumber party and they scoop them up. Well, everybody in that town for, you know, a couple of decades has had an extremely good idea who these folks are and who that crew was. You know, they they these were not mastermind criminals. You know, these guys lived in rural areas and they did whatever they wanted. You know, they had money, they had power. Then they had the connections and they just frankly didn't give a shit if somebody got in their way. So, you know, here we are 20 years down the road. Every you know, People are still afraid in that area and with good reason, you know, like these criminals got families, they got connections. And then the victims have, you know, families and, you know, people that are connected to it as well. So you've got this, you know, generational cycle of fear that's been instilled up there because people still aren't really talking about it. I mean, they do, but it's, <laughs> 
you, you just got to go there and you got to talk to locals kind of get the feel for it but it's still it's still a thing man and you know this case is no different you know and it's going to be interesting to see because you know the one thing that rural investigators lack it isn't you know i hear people coming down you know even now about the law enforcement out there and i, I know law enforcement out there they don't not care what their challenge is oftentimes is resources. And sometimes it's training because, you know, the hell, they don't live in New York City. They're not dealing with, you know, 20 murders a month. You know what I'm saying? That's like, right. That's exactly correct. Yeah. You know, yeah, they care. They, but they, there's only so many tools and so much training that they have. Now, I do know that, you know, the law enforcement guys I know out there, man, you know, those are really humble guys and they're always willing to reach out for help. And, mm -hmm. you know, if there's something they don't know, they'll, hell, they'll go find it, you know, because they go to church with these people. They go to, they, they do business at their stores, you know, they buy feed from them, they buy cattle from them. I mean, it, it isn't like a big city. These people are connected. So, you know, it, it has some advantages and some disadvantages. The advantages of hell law enforcement, Probably right now is a pretty damn good idea who they're looking at. Now, I'm not saying that those are maybe the guys or the people that did it, but you better believe they've got a pretty small suspect pool. You just, you can bet on it, you know, but on the other hand, it's going to be harder to get people to talk because you can't disappear out there. You know, it's not, you know, it, it's not an affluent community, but there's more money than you'd think out there, but people have roots there. That's the thing. You know, people have been living out there for over a hundred years, very proud of their land. They're proud of their communities and their churches, and they should be. It's They're actually pretty cool places to be uh, and live and raise a family, you know, without all the craziness that a big city can sometimes have. So, you know, I really do feel for the investigators out there. Now, as you had talked before, John, you know, if we get into a if we get into an area where the FBI is dealing with this, you know, they're going to come in and they're going to start working a, a dual investigation, right? They're going to be mm -hmm. working because they are going to have to cover every base. And you know how thorough the FBI is. They've got the tools, they've got the money, they've got the manpower, and they've got the training. And man, when those guys get old of something, watch out because they're going to be conducting one investigation down the road of you know, recovering live people. They want to find these women, absolutely, for a multitude of reasons. But on the other, you know, side of the street, they're going to be working a homicide investigation. So the pressure is going to be immense in that community for a while. So, you know, hopefully they will, you know, we we don't know because we've seen like over there in northeastern Oklahoma, I mean, it's 20, 22, 23 years or something. And there, there's there been a lot of people looking at uh, the Bible Freeman case for from a lot of different angles. And like I said, they did make an arrest in it, but you know, that was, that came way, way, way down the line. So uh, what the investigators really don't have sometimes is just cooperation. And it's not because- Right, exactly, right. It, it, and it's not because those communities don't care. The hell, they're afraid, you know? I mean, in a, you they're live in a afraid. place- yeah, if you live in a place and you don't have a neighbor for three or four miles and you dime some guy that's a known drug dealer with potentially cartel connections or something, hell, you know, you're a sitting duck. I mean, you know, you got to really take that yeah, into consideration. Sure. So I want to just kind of implore people like, you know, give these communities a little bit of a break. You know, there's a lot of chatter about this and that. And it's, you know, a lot of that is just not correct you know, in the totality of, of the investigation. So hopefully the, hopefully something will turn up sooner or later, because here we are 10 days down the road. That's, it's just a, you know, your gut says, man, that's a, that's a bad deal. Cause you know, they're again, they're not, they're not looking for a ransom. They're not looking for money. That was clearly getting somebody out of the way. So. Yeah, it's very, very, very concerning. And, uh, you know, you brought up a good point about uh, rural investigations because they really don't see a lot of these types of cases right. where typically your bigger cities see these cases quite a bit or all the time. So they're pretty much accustomed to it. And, you know, when you're when you're dealing in the city, um, you've got a lot of people that are coming and going. It's really transient. The cities are transient, okay? Mm -hmm. So people don't have a stake, a major stake in that particular area as an area where they grew up. Right. Over here, this is a 
totally other story. This is where not only did they grow up, but they plan on staying there. They have to live there with other neighbors, with people and around people who may be are considered bad actors. OK, and that mm -hmm. just part and parcel of the community. You know, right. every every community has the bad actors and you learn real quick when you're growing up in a small area. You know, they're the people you kind of stay away from. Right. The, you, you know, you uh, you don't want to mess with them. Like you said, out there, they don't, may not have a, a neighbor for a mile or two. Right. I mean, you know, nobody can hear you scream. Right. I mean, yeah. so, uh, you know, school can school can be out really, really, uh, really quickly. So, you know, they have to take uh, their survival, um, you know, into uh, into caution as well. They have to be very careful. All right. It's living there. Yeah. And then something else, the um, you know, in, inside this custody battle, I've heard about the father wrangler of the two children who I think is in rehab right now. God bless him. I hope he comes out of it. All right. Uh, you know, everybody's innocent here until proven guilty, folks. So just so you understand. And then we have the kids. And then we have uh, Wrangler's mother, who would be the grandmother of the two children. OK, and it looked like she was kind of front and center, too, um, you know, or up, up, up and close to the top of this custody battle because they were living under her roof, I believe. OK, that, you know, she she was calling the shots there. And, you know, but the one person I haven't heard about at all, nothing, is Wrangler's father. I don't know. And if anybody out there knows, let us know. Where is Wrangler's father? Is he deceased? Is, uh, you know, he divorced? And uh, or, you know, where is it? You know, because whenever I see self-destructive drug addiction, the first thing I kind of look at is, well, how what's the connection with this addict who's trying to recover and in rehab with their father? You know, is there a is there a connection there? Because I've not seen the father show up here to be supportive or to be helpful in any way. So I'm concerned where Wrangler's father is. OK, we know that the kid's biological mother is missing. OK, uh, so the biological mother is missing. The grandmother's uh, involved in this uh, custody battle, trying to help her son out, I'm sure. Uh, the biological father of the kids is in rehab, trying to get better. Right. But where's his father? Right. Where's his father? And when you think about it, you know, we haven't heard anything, and maybe the families are being told to keep quiet, but from uh, Veronica's parents, I haven't heard anything. Uh, I don't know if you guys have out there. I'm just interested in these different points of view and these different people, because every family is a system, okay? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, anything that affects one person in that system, one person of the family affects the whole system, the whole family. I mean, that's just the way it goes. Okay. Uh, so I'm just wondering, you know, what's going on uh, within that system. And uh, you haven't heard anything out there about that, right? No, no I haven't. I, I do know that, you know, both of those families got, you know, they've got a lot of family in the area you know that's all i can really say about that I, who's who who all the players are i don't know everything at this point but yeah i mean they, yeah they got a lot of family in that area which is common uh mm -hmm. for a you know for a rural area of oklahoma or kansas i mean like you were saying like that's where people put down roots and they're there multiple you said 100 years some are there 100 years families yeah. go back 100 years there right? yeah yeah easily easily yeah Mm -hmm. And, um, 
You know, the other thing uh, that is uh, of interest to me is how many people would be involved in an abduction of two women? Would it take two? Usually, but I've seen it done one person, definitely, uh, you know, uh, abduct two women. I've seen that happen too, usually with a gun. Mm -hmm. So we have to take all this into consideration. And the reason I ask this is because every person that may have been involved, be it one, two, or five, in this abduction of these two women is a link, mm -hmm. is a link. And you know as well as I do, if you're caught up in the life and you're caught up in the drug culture or any kind of illegal uh, work at all, lots of times that can produce uh, a snitch and somebody will oh, get yeah. in trouble for something else and they'll want to get out of it and say, well, let me tell you what happened to these two women over here. You know, so I, I wonder about that, too. I just wonder how many people really know and are involved in something like this, because every every single person uh, that has any kind of uh, involvement or knows of anything is an automatic link, which can become a weak link. And mm -hmm. I think that's why the police... And law enforcement is just being uh, hesitant right now. And uh, I'm sure they're working uh, some people right now as uh, as we speak to see where that can go. You know, the other thing, again, um, you know, we want to send our uh, sympathies uh, to the family and friends of the victims. Uh, no question about it. Uh, we want to put that out there. It's uh, I can't say it enough because it's pretty... You know, pretty sad, uh, pretty sad situation. You know, again, it's just not two missing women. It's two missing moms with kids. You know, the kids want their mothers. They want their mommies back, right? So uh, how are they feeling? What are they going through right now? What are they going through right now? You know, um, as far as the area in itself goes, you know, for our viewers, uh, and, 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 you know, for, um, you know, people that are just tuning in for the first time. When you're looking at that area, I mean, what are what what kind of percentages are we looking at that these women are going to be found OK and returned? OK, I mean. Off the top of my head. Stranger abductions go very badly for the victims in four to five hours. Not saying these are strangers, but even if they know their abductors, what kind of rage and anger and malice is between them and their abductors for whatever reasons. So the, being this far out, this many days out, uh, the percentages are not good. I, I hope I am completely wrong, and I hope we beat the percentages. And don't forget, you go to buy a Powerball, you go to buy a Mega Million, you know, the odds are against you. They're stacked against you millions and millions to one, okay? But guess what? Every two, three, four weeks, somebody hits the Powerball. Somebody beats the odds. Every, you know, so many, so many weeks go by, somebody hits the uh, mega million, you know? Right. And uh, so, you know, the odds can be beaten here. Let's hope. Uh, and, uh, you know, good thoughts and prayers for these uh, two girls, these two women. And um, let's hope uh, they can beat the odds and they can be found, uh, in a safe manner and uh, can be returned to their loved ones. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I don't know how else to uh, 
to serve this up. I mean, it's this is a a drastic, horrible uh, situation and 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 a terrible uh, affair for all the parties involved. And uh, again, I just can't imagine what's going through those kids' minds. Yeah, for real. And John, you brought up a interesting point while we were talking here about, you know, how many people would it take to get a couple of women off the road? And, and just, you know, for people that don't know the area, kind of backtracking a bit, it's important to know, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, especially in rural Oklahoma, you know, women are, you know, they're, they're very polite, you know, very traditional, but they're also extremely tough. You got to remember these women, you know, rural Oklahoma is not a cakewalk. <laughs> you know, I mean, people have to survive out there. You know, when you're ranching and farming, that is not easy work. I don't care who says different. You know, oftentimes these women grow up, you know, they work really close with the family on the farm or whatever they do. They're engaged in sports. Sports is a huge deal in, in the Midwest in general, and especially in those small towns. I mean, those are big rivalries. There's big prestige with sports. So, you know, these women are, you know, they, these are tough ladies, you know? I mean, the thought of one, I mean, sure, you know, if, if you're using a firearm or some other method to control, yeah, you can control multiple people, but man, you're talking about a couple of women that, you know, grew up in the rural part of the Midwest. I mean, that's not going to necessarily be the easiest task if you're just one guy. Can you do it? Absolutely. But you know, make no mistake about it. I, I believe 100% from the people I know in that part of the world that those women are extremely tough. And I don't believe that they just, want, you know, went willingly. I mean, I, I got to believe that some sort of, mm -hmm. you know, wrangling them, getting getting them into their control zone, like you always say, is going to be a much bigger job for one guy than it would be for more than one guy. Mm -hmm. So, or one person rather. So, I mean, you know, we'll see what that bears out, but yeah, that's that's not like dealing, uh, you know, with people in the city a lot of times. I mean, country people, rural people in general are, are pretty tough customers, man. They don't screw around, and you gotta think too. You know, hell, everybody out there carries a firearm more or less. No, I'm not. I don't know if these women did. You know, they're going to be picking up kids responsibly. They're most likely not going to be dealing with that, but. They probably aren't unfamiliar with how to use them either. And they're probably not unused to scrapping with dudes. So, man, I, it's just, you know, it's just the way of life out there. So uh, how many people it took to get them controlled, I don't know, but I got to believe it wasn't the easiest task. And then controlling them from one vehicle, say, to another vehicle. Again, yeah. we don't know for sure. But it looks that way, you know, that po very possibly two vehicles were used for, you know, the transportation of these women, these two women and the vehicle they came up in, then the vehicle that they were moved into, you know, uh, that they were abducted and uh, may get into. Or, like I said, you know, marched uh, you know, off into the field or down the road or wherever. You know, uh, I, I I don't know, but definitely when you're when you're switching vehicles and, um, you know, uh, it's hit the fan mm -hmm. and you've got you've got a gun out. I mean, it uh, doesn't take a genius to figure out what might happen next. And, you know, uh, when you have people that are uh, really extremely uh horrified and fearful uh and that panic starts to set in with that adrenaline rush i mean anything can ensue any kind of fight any kind of physical altercation anything you know uh, stabbing shooting anything can happen and uh when that happens you could have more uh, DNA and trace evidence and fingerprints. I mean, you just have more of everything, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's between the two cars. And so I, th I think, uh, you know, more will be revealed here 
Um, I really don't think this abductor is going to be doing any uh, brain surgery anytime soon. I think, um, you know, that, uh, you know, he's left or she's left or they've left evidence. And, uh, you know, it's going to be found and followed uh, directly mm -hmm. to them. I mean, I really, uh, I really believe this, you know. Um, before we break, is there anything you want to go over? Anything else you want to say? No, I think I think we've covered an awful lot here, you know, based on what we know right now. So for now, if, for now, yeah. Yeah, until you know we keep digging and turn something up or something, you know, gets released by law enforcement. This is just kind of what we've got in front of us. Yeah, buckle up. I got a feeling. I hope I'm wrong, but I just had one of those feelings. It's gonna be a long ride. Yeah. You know, I've just I've just got one of those kind of I call them kind of Delphi feelings, man, where yeah, you know, that went on for what six years. You know, right. I mean, uh, you know, that it's I, I got a feeling this uh you know, this can go on for uh this can be quite a ride uh on this one. But anyway, I wanna thank you so much. Uh, Dustin, we really appreciate having you on, having your expertise. Um, we'll be in touch with you sooner than later. Um, we appreciate any time you have that you can give to us, that you give to the investigation. I know the victims and their families, I'm sure, are very, very uh, uh, thrilled to have you involved. And, uh, you know, I mean, I can't, uh, I can't talk for victims or their families. But I'm sure, based on the feedback that we've gotten so far, that there's a lot of people out there, you know, uh, praying and hoping for these women and focusing on getting them home sooner than later. And they, they're just very appreciative of any work that anybody's doing to try and help them get home. And if anybody out there knows anything, please follow the phone number we leave up and contact law enforcement first. Yes, if you don't want to contact law enforcement, you can leave us a tip and we'll get over to law enforcement. But please contact law enforcement first, okay? Because they're there. They're going to respond quicker. They're on this like white on rice, man. I mean, they are really, really on this, okay? And uh, they will move quickly. You know, uh, you know at uh, warp speed, you know, on, uh, on any good tip that they get, okay? And we will have a link up uh, for Dustin. Uh, you'll see some of Dustin's artwork. He's a great artist, fantastic artist, and along with being a great investigator, really has uh, what it takes. And, you know, feel free to check out his link, check Dustin out. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's a person we, uh, we really have a lot of faith and confidence in, and we do rely on. <laughs> with all that being said, Dustin, God bless and thank you so much. And God bless to all our audience out there. We can't thank him, thank, can't thank you guys enough for your support. Uh, if you like what we've done today, please subscribe. Please like it if you like us. And uh, you know, we'll uh we'll uh keep you posted on what's going on here because we're not letting this one go. And um, you know, uh it's only going to be a matter of time. It might be a while. I'd like to see it sooner than later, but we're not going to let this go. Um, we're going to stay on top of this, and uh, we're going to try and get to the bottom of it. So, again, thank you all for tuning in. Be safe out there. It's a very, very violent world we live in. Please take care and uh, be good to yourself. And until we meet again, God bless. Thanks again, Dustin. Take care. Yeah, thanks a lot, John. Thanks to your audience. And my heart goes out to the families of these women as well. So, yeah, it's good to be here uh, under, you know, pretty rough circumstances. But thanks for having me on. I always appreciate it, brother. Our honor, brother. Take care. Take care.